Jordan Peterson was born in 1962 and is a Canadian author, media commentator, and psychologist. He specializes in psychopharmacology, abnormal, neuro, clinical, personality, social, industrial, and organizational, religious, ideological, political, and creative psychology. Peterson has used his knowledge of the field in his clinical practice as a Harvard researcher and professor, and as the host of his own podcast. His most famous book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, has sold over 5 million copies worldwide. Welcome to the Two Retired Homeschoolers, our 14th episode. I'm Holly, the man-voiced one. And I'm Rebecca, and I'm not going to say it. (laughs) She'll accept that she's the baby-voiced eventually. Um, Okay, so today we're diving into the 12 Rules for Life. This was quite a book. You want to start with first impressions? First impressions. It, um, you know, I, I actually really like Jordan Peterson. I've listened to him quite a bit over the past, not so much of the past few years, but before that I did. I listened mostly to his psychological significance of the biblical stories lectures, and I really liked them and found them helpful in some ways. But for some reason, I never wanted to read his book, and it was kind of a slog. Like, it's not bad, but it was just hard for me to get through. So I, for the longest time, I was always interested in Peterson. I had also listened to his biblical lectures, and I liked his secular interpretation of things from the standpoint of psychology. That was especially interesting to me. And I, It's really cool. Like, I think it's really cool that, like, he's, I don't know, just that the Bible is true on a literal and psychological level. Oh, yeah. And how he points that out. Yeah, and seeing its psychological significance just helps you appreciate it so much more. I also love his perspectives on life. I I feel like he's a genius, and it's funny. um, (laughs) The lady I take care of for my job, we were talking about Hitler the other day. We, like, sat down and did some research on his early days and tried to figure out what made him so crazy. (laughs) We were talking about him, and it occurred to me that Hitler was, like, such a genius. Like, how do you brainwash an entire country into, like, world domination pursuits and then other countries, like, get other countries to ally themselves with you um, or, or coerce others if you didn't brainwash them? And then also get other countries to think, oh, it's fine. He's he's not going to keep going. Oh, it's, oh, oh, well, he kept going, but, but it's fine. He's not going to keep, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and especially a guy who came from a background where he was, like, physically abused by his father, and he was homeless, and, like, he had truly lived the bottom rung of life, Um, and and to go from there to just this mad, successful, crazy, horrible person. (laughs) Um, And I was thinking, like, I, I feel like those things go together so much, like, being a genius and also being crazy um and by crazy I don't mean you are always a world dominating psychopath like sometimes you're crazy is like still so brilliant but it's just so far out there that other people are like what (laughs) and I'm not saying Jordan Peterson is crazy but I am saying he's a genius and I do think that a lot of his ideas are just so abstract and so seemingly absurd at face value um that it causes people to stop and think. And I think that's why he's famous is because he just says a lot of things that are very bizarre, but also very true. Um, And so I do think he's a little bit of a genius and is sometimes hard to relate to just because it's like, oh, what are you talking about? (laughs) But but yeah, so this book was, I agree with you, is a bit of a slog for a long time. And I'm the reason why this episode came out so late is because we tried to record this on the first six rules. We realized, oh, we're not going to be able to cover all of this, so it's better if we have a part one and a part two. Um, and then we had a technical malfunction with the initial recording, so we decided to just record them all together in one episode. And we're not going to be covering even the greater part of the book, only just some a few major points. But... Um, I am glad that I was able to read through it rather at a leisurely pace because it helped me appreciate it more. And 
it wasn't just a continual, oh my gosh, I just need to get through this chapter. Although sometimes it was, um, but something shifted. <laughs> like the more I read him, the more I, I started to think like him. Um, and by the time that I got to the last three chapters, I was really looking forward to like, to getting back to reading it and turning the page. And um, it just helped me. It's really nice. Yeah, it, I couldn't believe I arrived there, but it, it's so bizarre. I arrived there so late, like the last three chapters. <laughs> but then I started listening to his videos on YouTube again and listening to his daughter's YouTube videos, Michaela. I feel like she's very underrated. Um, and I learned more about his life and her life. And yes, I am very much in a Jordan Peterson zone right now. <laughs> so that, that was my very long first impressions. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and list all the rules. What are the 12 rules for life? Okay, so number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Number two, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Three, make friends with people who want the best for you. Four, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. Five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Seven, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Eight, tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Ten, be precise in your speech. 11. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. 12. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. And so we picked out a couple of our favorites to talk about, Holly. Yeah, we narrowed it down to four. Um, you want to start with, I, I guess we'll start with our first one. Treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. Uh, I think this was the longest chapter in the whole book. It felt like a little mini book of its own, more like just a long essay. <laughs> um and I really liked it because he points out a couple of truths that aren't super evident, but you know it's true once you're faced with it. Um, one being people don't like themselves very much, at least people who aren't living correctly. Um, and most people don't live correctly or they'll live partially correct. Then he talks about chaos and order, which is represented by like female and male or the yin and yang. Um, a lot of this has to do with just philosophy this is way more than just psychology or self-help. He talks about, a lot about theology, philosophy, history, mythology. Um, anyway, and, and he talks about the ideal way to live your life is to walk the border between chaos and order. Because if you t have too much order, it's like everything's way too strict. Uh, life loses a bit of its meaning. If you live completely in chaos, it's like you can't stop aiming. That's what humans literally have hardwired into their brain is just to aim at something, to live for something. And and you're just going to be like scrambled and messed up all the time. And the thing I really liked that stood out to me, though, in this chapter was um, he uses the analogy of Eve eating the fruit. And I say not an apple because we have no idea if it was an apple or not. Sorry, I will die on this hill. <laughs> and, um, he talks about Eve eating the fruit and receiving knowledge of good and evil. You know, Christians always interpret that in one way as, as like, you know, that was the entry of consciousness and therefore we have the ability to sin. Um, but he looks at it from a different standpoint and it's like, we now have the responsibility, in quotes, to eternally sacrifice the present for the future. And he talks about all the sacrifices the Israelites had to make throughout the Old Testament and how that is a representation of like, when we were living in paradise, we were like animals, uh, which, and I don't think this is what the Bible's saying. This is what he's saying, but we were like animals in that we didn't have consciousness like normal humans have. And um, like we weren't Spartan enough to figure out, oh, life is going to be better if we like give up some things in the present for the future. But now that we know that, now that we have that consciousness, it's like life is like better but also way more painful because we, now we have like a moral obligation to make life better for ourselves and others and now we have a moral obligation to sacrifice which from the bible that that came from sin um and i guess jordan peterson is making the argument that that came from consciousness but even then the consciousness only realizes that because there is like sin if you want to call it that well because it's the, because they eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil mm -hmm. so like it makes sense for him to interpret it as consciousness being the thing that 
cast us out of paradise. Right. And, and I do think that's true to a certain extent. Yeah. That it, like we did receive an extra bit of consciousness that we didn't have before. I don't know if this is relevant, but it reminded me of um, C.S. Lewis's book, Paralandra. It's his idea of what would happen when life is created on Venus the same way it is on Earth. And the temptation happens again. And um, basically, like, C.S. Lewis's idea was that, you know, the knowledge of good and evil was a thing that, and this is probably, like, a thing that Christians believe, but the knowledge of good and evil was a thing that Adam and Eve would would learn, should have learned, but they should have, they should have done it through, like, they should have obeyed God and then it would have all been better, but they still would have gained the knowledge of good and evil. You know, do you think there's a difference between good and evil and right and wrong? Because for God to tell them, do not eat from this tree, like, basically, this is wrong for you to do this. And like, in order for it to be justifiable that they would receive consequences for their actions, they would have to know for, to a certain extent, that this action is bad, whatever bad means. And so do you think there is a difference between having moral consciousness and knowing, oh, uh, not good, good in a more, I don't know, elementary sense? (laughs) Well, maybe the tree of the, like, maybe the knowledge of good and evil is more, like, related to discernment. Hmm. Like, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, they know, yes, yes, you should obey God and no, you should not disobey God and whatever, but, like, the knowledge of good and evil is, like, an understanding of why you know these things, and perhaps, like, when good is disguised as evil or evil is disguised as good, you would be able to discern that. Almost like it's the first time, and we use the word consciousness as in, like, awakeness, but it's almost like they received their conscience for the very first time. Like, they've never felt guilt guilt before then, and now they suddenly have this internal critic that's able to decipher good and it's it's the same reason why they were ashamed when they were naked and tried to cover themselves up it's because like for the first time they realized like oh like i feel this thing within me that just knows like in my gut like has this special knowledge i can't even explain yeah but it's still true that for them to be culpable they had to have known beforehand Mm -hmm. like that they shouldn't do it Yeah, which is why I brought up, like, there must be a difference between knowing right and wrong and good and evil. I think, like, um, I've been recently working with our puppy, trying to teach him, not really tricks, but just how to not harass me. And he knows, like, there's certain boundaries, like, there's a certain room in the house he's not allowed to go into. Uh, Funny story, it's my room. And, (laughs) like, he knows, he'll sit on the border between the hall and my room now would he be able to give a moral explanation for why that's wrong no like he's a dog but he knows like it like there's consequences for his actions and so in that sense maybe he knows the difference between right and wrong and not good and evil but anyway yeah that that's something interesting to briefly touch on the last thing i had to say on this chapter and i'd love to hear any thoughts you have he talks about working with yourself and trying to get yourself to do good things by like bargaining with yourself Um, here's just a quote. You must keep the promises you make to yourself and reward yourself so that that you can trust and motivate yourself. Imagine that you are someone with whom you must negotiate. Imagine further that you are lazy, touchy, resentful, and hard to get along with. With that attitude, it's not going to be easy to get you moving. You might have to use a little charm and playfulness. Excuse me, you might say to yourself without irony or sarcasm. I'm trying to reduce some of the unnecessary suffering around here. I could use some help. Keep the derision at bay. I'm wondering if there is anything that you would be willing to do. I'd be very grateful for your service. Ask honestly and with humility. That's no simple matter. Maybe you don't trust yourself. You're a bad employee, but a worse boss. (laughs) Oh, yeah, no, I, I thought that was good. I especially liked the part where he was saying, like, to not be a tyrant to yourself. Like, if you make yourself do one responsible thing and then another and then another until you, like, are, like, I'm done. This is, like, this isn't worth it. You just go through, like, a cycle of 
burnout basically and you need to like be like okay if you do this thing we get to sit down and read your favorite book for an hour and you need to actually keep those promises to yourself instead of being like oh we did one good thing we need to do five thousand more (laughs) like you need to work at a like sustainable rate with yourself yeah you really do need to treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping like no one that you're helping would you be like oh great you did one little measly tiny thing come on you can do five thousand more just just (laughs) get with it yeah yeah i also loved that one i don't remember the quote exactly but he said like you are not your own possession to torture and mistreat self-sacrifice is great that's not in question here it's the fact that like we think it's okay to do things to ourselves and say things about ourselves and just you know treat ourselves in ways that we would never treat anyone else and it's actually just as wrong because we are also people with value and god's children all right next rule um compare yourself to who you were yesterday not to who someone else is today um He talks about how the inner critic needs to be directed. And I mentioned this earlier. It's like we constantly have an arrow pulled back on our bow and we we just need to find a target. Um, And if you don't have anything specific that you're aiming for intentionally, you're just going to grasp at anything and and start aiming at anything that's in front of you. Um, and, And that's how comparison works, basically. He has a quote to kind of illustrate this. Hold on. You know, me and my quotes, I'm so obsessed. Um, Okay. When the internal critic puts you down using such comparisons, here's how it operates. First, it selects a single arbitrary domain of comparison, fame, maybe, or power. Then it acts as if that domain is the only one that is relevant. Then it contrasts you unfavorably with someone truly stellar within that domain. It can take that final step even further, using the unbridgeable gap between you and its target of comparison as evidence for the fundamental injustice of life. That way, your motivation to do anything at all can be effectively undermined. Those who accept such an approach to self-evaluation certainly can't be accused of making things too easy for themselves, but it's just as big of a problem to make things too bi- too difficult. Um, That's true. And, and I loved the part where he brought up, like, and then it acts like this domain is the only thing that ever mattered. It's like, yep, that is really how comparison works. Yeah. And it takes so little into account when it does it. Like, what might have predisposed this person to be much better than you? Or what is missing from their life that you have in your life because you aren't wholly giving yourself to whatever pursuit they have? Like, comparison is very narrow-minded. Um Yeah. And basically the antidote he proposes to this problem is using the word narrow again, like narrow down your interests, figure out what you're good at specifically, what what matters to you. Like, don't just aim at whatever targets in front of you, figure out the target that's best for you that you'll be good at shooting at and 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 is meaningful for you and it aligns with your values. And then after you've done that, be open to looking around at other targets if if you're wrong about whatever target you selected because a lot of the time you are wrong because you're developing and you haven't fully figured yourself out and this is usually around when we're becoming an adult that we're making decisions. Um, and so open your eyes because uh, what was the analogy he used? Like you're in a job and you're trying to climb the ladder And in order to do so, you may have to compromise your values a bit and you're miserable in the job anyway, but you think that climbing the ladder is the only thing that matters. And if you just opened your eyes a bit, maybe you could be succeeding so much more in a different career and getting a lot out of that. But making huge changes like that is so intimidating and so hard for most people. Rule eight, tell the truth or at least don't lie. This one was one of my favorites because I felt like this chapter articulated exactly why I find it's better to tell harsh truths than kind half lies. Hmm. Like it, it, like it, it's it has to do with respect. If you respect someone and genuine, like there's no point in lying unless you want to hide something from someone or shield yourself. So you either don't have self-respect or you don't respect them enough to tell them the truth. And also, people pick up on the fact that you don't respect them. And so it makes, like, 
social interaction harder and trickier. Mm. And so it's just better to tell the truth, like from a practical standpoint as well as a moral one. That's true. Yeah. I think you maybe we're thinking of the chapter in a more holistic way like it applies to absolutely everything which I think is true like that is what Jordan Peterson was saying um but and I've heard him say that in other situations and also like it kind of ties into the be precise in your speech rule where he's like just stop saying things that you know aren't true like only say something if you know it's true like it helps you actually learn what you actually think about things better it helps you actually clarify what's good and bad in your relationships with people. It just it just simplifies your life, makes your life better, makes you happier in the long run. Definitely makes you more contented and focused right. in every respect. He, like, he does believe it in a holistic way, as I do. And as you apparently don't? Well, so <laughs> I like how he phrased it. Always tell the truth, basically, no matter what, or at least don't lie. I think truth is what sets you free and it's like what god stands for and it's what you should stand for and always you should always speak the truth no matter what but i do think that some truth is more important than other truth and it it's more necessary well, obviously yeah i it's more necessary to speak out about it in some situations than it is in others so like if someone is at if there's like Okay, but here's my thing. How necessary it is to speak out about it, I don't really think is dependent on how much someone will be offended by it. And I think that you do think it is. Like, the more someone will be offended by it, the more you think, oh, you should, like, maybe reconsider and reconsider and reconsider and not say it in the end. Hmm. But that's not my standard for judging whether or not I should keep my mouth shut, be tactful, whatever. Yeah, you might be right about that, but I think... I think it's more about I take into account whether it might hurt someone's feelings or not, but that's not really the deciding factor for me. It's the deciding factor is more like, does this thing that we're talking about actually matter? Um, the other thing with telling the truth is like, if if people know that you tell the truth, like they don't necessarily know that you, you're telling them the truth the first time you tell them the truth. But if you have a habit of telling them the truth and they know that they can trust you to tell the truth, that's really nice. Like, they can trust you. And then if they come to you with, like, something that they really want to know the truth about, but a lot of people would not want to tell them the truth, they know that you will tell them the truth. And that's, like, a good thing. Like, um, I know you haven't read it, but the brothers Karamazov, one of the brothers is like that, and he's, like, the sweetest, most wonderful person. And there's times in the book where other characters don't ask him a question because they know he'll tell them the truth. And there's other times when they work up their courage to ask him because they need to know. And they're, like, scared because they know he'll tell them the truth. But they also, like, they're depending on him to tell them the truth. And it's just a really good quality that he has that he will tell them the truth. And that they sometimes they sometimes need that quality. Mm. So, I, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's a cool, like, thing that... There, that there could be people that you could always depend on to tell you the truth. Yeah. I like, I, I'm not saying I am that person, but I, I do want to be that person. I do, I am in the process of trying to become that person, I suppose. I would definitely say you're that person. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I would say people can rely on me not to lie. <laughs> <laughs> So there's that. Um, and that's not nothing, as Peterson would say. Um, that is not nothing. <laughs> and yeah. that's not so good. That's, a good rule. <laughs> that's not good. Yeah, it is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I just love the way he talks, like, so much. Um, the reason why I like this chapter is because I love how he explains and illustrates how the truth will set you free. One of those ways is like in your relationships and how important it is to say what you really think and feel. Um, uh-huh. yep. do, do you think Actually I can squeeze through. in a couple more block quotes in this episode? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You can try. That was supposed to be an absolutely Holly. 
Okay. Molly, I have faith in your abilities. You can do anything you set your mind to. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> if you say no to your boss or your spouse or your mother when it needs to be said, then you transform yourself into someone who can say no when it needs to be said. If you say yes when no needs to be said, however, you transform yourself into someone who can only say yes, even when it is very clearly time to say no. If you ever Okay, that's so true. You, Rebecca, are so good at this, and you and Emily, I very much look, I, I've noticed this behavior in you two, and you've been good influences on me in this regard. Anyway, um, if you ever want to- we say no. Yeah, you say no when you really mean it, and that's important. I think that's why, that's what I trip on, on the most in telling the truth. Like, I don't lie, but- I mean, everyone lies, I guess, but like without knowing it, um, like all the time. But that's a theory, I guess, and one that Peterson holds to very strongly, and I like half agree. Anyway, um, but I do lie to myself. I think a lot. Like I think that the way I should think or the way I should feel is the way that, like, I manipulate myself into being who I think I should be a lot of the time by telling myself lies. I've noticed that after I read this chapter. And you know, I, now that you say that, yeah. Yeah. I, I've noticed that about you, too. Yep. I mean, I, I <laughs> that was blunt, but yeah. No, that was, I didn't see that one as blunt. <laughs> I didn't want to be like, oh, yes, like, you're just so self-deceived. That sounds kind of mean, but, like, that's not really what I meant. I just, I have noticed you do that. Yeah. But the thing is, you eventually figure it out, too. Like, you talk, you talk yourself into liking things that you don't like, and then you eventually figure out, oh, no, I hate this, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you how many sermons I've listened to, and I'm like, well, I just need to appreciate this because I'm a Christian, and um, I just, like, there, there's always something that can be, like, a redeeming factor in anything so I just need to find that thing and then I can like it I, I feel this very strong need to like things I've found <laughs> and so I often coerce myself into trying to like it when I don't and I think I'd be I'd understand myself a lot more and I'd get along with myself a lot better if I was more truthful and frank with myself yeah the thing I think most interesting that you do that with is people like, that's very fascinating to me, how much you do that with people. I just figured out this thing about myself. Like, I realized that I thought that loving people meant liking them. And I didn't really mm. think that in every essence of the phrase. I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I totally believe that. And at the same time, that I have caveats to it. Like, um, like, I can dislike someone's behavior, but I still need to like the redeemable qualities about, or I still need to find something I like about them. And if I'm not able to do that, then I must just not love them. Um, and I think love is a lot more about appreciating someone's worth and believing that the, you must, like, they deserve for you to treat them with respect, no matter how much respect they actually deserve or not based off of their behavior, just because they're created in God's image. And um, God calls us to love people because he loves them. And, and I think that's more what love is about rather than liking them. But yeah, I realized that like, I just always feel th this obligation to like people. And this is why you've been friends with me for so long. Once you're finally <laughs> honest with yourself, we will part ways. It's over, Rebecca. I'm sick of your bluntness. <laughs> this is a good place to pick back up. If you ever wonder how perfectly ordinary, decent people could find themselves doing the terrible things that the gulag, is that how you say it? Gulag. Or gulag camp guards did. Gulag. <laughs> you now have your answer. By the time no seriously needed to be said, there was no one else left capable of saying it. If you betray yourself, if you say untrue things, if you act out a lie, you weaken your character. If you have a weak character, then adversity will mow you down when it appears, as it will inevitably. And that was, I, I like, there was, okay, I took a psychology class in, and I know this is going to take a bit to explain, but I th feel like it's totally worth it. Um, I took a psychology class in college, and they talked about this very famous, they did this study, and I forgot what it was called, but it's super famous, so 
but basically it was this thing where oh is it the is it the famous one where like people had to shock people yes, and they gave the wrong yes. answer and then they kept shocking them at the instigation of the like person running the study until the people weren't responding anymore and then the person running would tell them no do it again and like yeah and like the person that they were supposedly shocking was actually an actor who like had to like pretend that like they were in pain and like yeah eventually like just like stop responding like they died and then like a shockingly high percentage of people um went all the way and like not knowing it actually like delivered fatal voltage to these people insane without yeah yeah thank you for explaining that uh yes i that learning about that shook me like i remember saying out loud like that's not real when i watched it for the first time and when i like finally realized that it was real i was like okay i know the bible says that people are like not inherently good like they're pretty much inherently bad just because of our sinful natures but like i'd never and and i and i knew about the holocaust and i knew about these horrible horrible things that happened in history but like for some reason seeing that was what really turned the switch and helped me realize that at face value and it, it did I think it's because you realize those are regular people yeah those aren't like the fringe people of you know those that's not the fringe those are regular people that they selected for that study it really does explain how like normal german citizens could get up in the morning be like a guard at a holocaust camp all day watch people get murdered and tortured and then come home and have dinner and you know spend t some time with kids and just go on with their normal life like if you just get to the point where you can never say no you really are susceptible to doing horrific things the last rule we're doing is i believe number 11 mm -hmm. do not bother children when they are skateboarding i think our version of this is don't bother kids when they're climbing trees <laughs> same idea <laughs> It's, it talks about aggression being very necessary and not an inherently negative trait. And that you have to allow, you can't, you can't safety proof the world. Like, like there's always going to be danger and you have to optimize it, not minimize it. Because the, as you try to minimize it, you just take away like all the good things, all the things worth doing until people are so sick and tired of life having no until people like go out and do stupid things like you know because they just they live in this ridiculously safe world that's safe to no purpose like you you, ha you have to let you can't over shelter your kids you have to let your kids do things that make you uncomfortable a little bit you have to let people do things that like i don't know i just i really can't articulate this well at all but i really appreciated the chapter because it's something i've thought about a lot lately um Actually, for several years, I've thought about this, like, without, like, challenge, so without, like, confronting chaos, as Peterson would probably put it, um, and pushing outside the boundaries that you know are, like, you get stale and slothful and also resentful, and when you, like, try to completely accident-proof the world, you make it poorer, not richer. Mm. And I also think that, like, in our modern times, we have a particular fear of physical risk like physical harm up to death is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you so it has to be avoided no matter what you sacrifice to avoid it and like that's because we kind of think that you know physical harm is the worst like death is the worst thing that could happen to you but I don't actually believe that it is so like yeah trust me getting hurt isn't the worst thing <laughs> And I, I don't, I don't know. This is something I've come to realize. Like, I, I don't know so much about raising kids this way because I don't have kids, but like, for my own self, not, not to, not to see, not to put caution above, above things that matter more than caution. And also in relationships with other people, you know, like help people out. Don't, don't play on their fears until they also just get completely stale from never taking the risks that they need to take. Like, I have always hated in stories the wife character of, like, the main character who's, like, mad at him for doing his job and his job is dangerous. And she's like, 
but how could you do this to me because I love you and if you get hurt or die it's like the worst and how could you do this to me and your children and then she like gets mad and tries to get him to not do the thing he needs to do like and that character is often presented as sympathetic Emily and I were just talking about this but I really really hate that character because I guess I sort of understand where she's coming from but like you're not being fair to your husband and you're not really being like that's you're just completely failing in your role yeah when you won't let him do his job i i feel like parents are also failing in their roles if they don't let their kids actually grow up and do difficult dangerous things within reason yeah i also think it's important for kids to learn that they can confront danger like because if a kid is completely cut off from danger um it's really scary to them and i've made a habit of if I'm scared to do something I I think about it and I'm like okay is this fear like ration like there are some cases where I'm like okay yeah you're smart to be scared to do this don't do this it's stupid but sometimes it's like okay there's like a small danger but I can be careful and do this and I make myself do those things so that I don't I don't know it just seems important to me to be able to deal with risk Mm. and I think that I just, I think that you shouldn't completely cut off husband, children, whoever from risk. Yeah. I think you should let them, let them alone while they're skateboarding. (laughs) That's a good way of putting it. I like how he draws the difference between men and women in this regard. Like women have a natural tendency to be more agreeable, more sympathetic, empathetic, more cautious and uh, neurotic. And this is just <clears throat> statistically speaking, men have uh, like a higher probability of aggression and taking initiative and kind of the opposite of those things. And he talks about how what what's currently socially acceptable, it's like the pendulum right now is currently on the agreeableness side. So women are a bit more agreeable than they should be, and men are also a bit more agreeable than they should be. And too much agreeableness can be devastating um, in relationships, which I want to talk about a bit later, but culturally. For women, this means that often they can't do anything. Like, they can't push past their fears. They can't, like, move forward in life. Like, it's paralyzing for them. And for men... It's not so much that is they're a bit handicapped and a bit too not as inclined to do the hard things they should do. And that doesn't help them. Yeah. So the thing I wanted to talk about specifically with this as like in regard to relationships is he talks about having a moral obligation to speak up for yourself or otherwise a relationship will just fall apart and there'll be resentment on one or both sides inevitably. And um, he talks about two strategies for doing this. The first one is like, you need to gather at evidence and, and form a strategy for when you're gonna confront someone about something that upsets you or, or you need to just express some feeling that you're having. Um, and this goes for all relationships, by the way. I don't mean romantically specifically. Um, And when you confront this person, you need to give them several examples. Like, you need to have these prepared. Most people can't have more than three off the top of their head. So this is important for debate. And then I'll just read the quote for the second strategy he mentions. It's a good idea to tell the person you are confronting exactly what you would like them to do instead of what they have done or currently are doing. You might think, if they love me, they would know what to do. That's the voice of resentment. Assume ignorance before malevolence. It's the voice of a woman. Yes. <laughs> Assume ignorance before malevolence. If you try to determine exactly what you want, you might find that it is more difficult than you think. Make your request as small and reasonable as possible, but ensure that it is the fulfillment that would satisfy you. Um, and I thought that was just solid advice all around. <laughs> you know, I feel like this is kind of going back, but I, I thought of... Actually, one of the really, really helpful things that I heard Peterson say a long time ago. Um, I'm very, like, shy, as you know. And 
I always find it really hard to like call someone or if I need to call or like go up to a person that I need to talk to and you know buy tickets from them or whatever the heck I need to do and so like it's like really stupid things that aren't that bad and I was having so much trouble with them at college and the advice I got from people was just do it like it's not that bad like you think it's worse than it is as soon as you do it you'll realize it's not that bad and then it'll be easier the next time so like a chump I listened to these people and I thought they would be correct and I did it and it was horrible and embarrassing and excruciating <laughs> and I was like well that was a lie I I'm never I'm never doing anything like this again because it's every bit as bad as I thought it would be in fact possibly worse <laughs> like what are they talking about and I heard Peterson talking about it and he said what he tells people is um like these things that are hard for you and scary for you to do whatever they may be do them and you will find out yeah they were hard and scary and unpleasant but now you know you can do them and that's how it helps you to do them like in the future is that you know that you can despite how hard they are you've proven yourself to yourself not you've proven that this thing isn't that bad no it is that bad but like you can deal with it mm -hmm. and I just I don't know why but I found that so helpful and that's kind of I guess what this chapter is sort of about so I just thought of it yeah he's kind of appalled at this postmodernist hatred of just being itself existence itself like to him it's this gift that you exist and some people throw it back you know in the giver's face and are like it would be better if I hadn't existed and he finds that like just an appalling attitude it really bothers him um and that for some reason made me think of when we were talking about how you often try to like create unique villains and it their motivations always come down to something very like obvious like greed or whatever you know mm -hmm. and like, what's the closest thing to a villain that's, like, evil for the sake of being evil, but who's not a cliche? Yeah. And there's a Helen McInnes book that it made me think of. And what when Peterson was talking about um, people who just hate being, it made me think of this villain. because it's So it's a Helen McInnes book, so it's, like, a spy novel. I'm not going to say which one because it's a spoiler. Because, like, at the beginning they're like, oh, wait, is it the communists? Are the communists the bad guys here? And it turns out that the bad guy is actually a nihilist. And it was his experiences in life in World War II that caused him to come to this conclusion about the world and to do the things he's doing. Like, he, he, he doesn't want, he doesn't have an ideology that he's serving. He doesn't want to, you know, he's not a communist. He's a nihilist. He wants to just destroy and wreck and reduce things to meaninglessness because that's how he thinks they truly are. Yeah. And, um... I really like that book and it was a really interesting villain and very convincing because that is in fact how some people see the world. Yeah. Kind of disturbing though. I, I don't know if that was like relevant at all, but yeah. I thought of it and wanted to tell you about it. Well, re whether it was relevant or not, that was a brilliant connection. Like that's exactly what I was looking for actually. The only thing is like writing that convincingly as someone who's not a nihilist, that would have to be quite a task so I would be interested to see how she pulled it off um yeah because she definitely wasn't a nihilist um so the last thing I wanted to mention that is one of Jordan Peterson's things that he says a lot and most people don't he likes to quote this verse from the bible don't throw pearls to the, to the pigs um and it <laughs> means don't talk to people who aren't listening to you or who won't listen to you like, insist to yourself that your words have meaning and that your thoughts are valuable. And don't let other people tell you otherwise or convince you otherwise by their behavior. And also, what's the point of talking to someone who won't listen to you in the first place? But you can tell when someone's truly listening to you or not. Um, and I just really liked that he brought that up. And I can tell when Holly's not listening to me because Fassie says, yeah, uh-huh, to something that she should not have said, yeah, uh-huh, to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you, and that's very good. Um, are we ending? Because before we end, I 
I wrote down like a couple quotes I really liked. Yeah, favorite quotes. This really is the section them. for that. Favorite quotes, hooray, my favorite section. Okay. <laughs> my very first favorite quote is you can be pretty smart if you just shut up. Yep. Uh, let's go back and forth. Let's play ping pong here because I have four. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, my, my first one is perhaps happiness is always to be found in the journey uphill and not in the fleeting sense of satisfaction awaiting at the next peak. It is very bad form to actually put someone down when you are only pretending to put them down. <laughs> what do you know about yourself? You are, on the one hand, the most complex thing in the entire universe, and on the other, someone who can't even set the clock on your microwave. <laughs> um, what can possibly compare to the pleasures of sophisticated and well-practiced martyrdom? <laughs> People think they think, but it's not true. It's mostly self-criticism that passes for thinking. True thinking is rare, just like true listening. Thinking is listening to yourself. It's difficult. To think, you have to be at least two people at the same time. Then you have to let those people disagree. I really like that. Mm -hmm. And if you think tough men are dangerous, wait until you see what weak men are capable of. Oh my gosh, yes. I can't believe I didn't put that one down, but yeah, I love that. Do you have one more? No. Oh, okay. Well, I have one more. Okay. Say what you mean. So that you can find out what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> that, see, these are all solid quotes. I love Jordan Peterson so much. He can be so long-winded, but also so pithy. Yes. <laughs> you know what he is? He's a scientific atheist Chesterton. That's what Jordan Peterson is. Yeah. Who sees a lot of value in Christianity. Well... Thank you, everyone, for listening to the 14th episode of The Two Retired Homeschoolers. Join us three weeks from now to read or discuss Blink or Blink of an Eye by Ted Decker with special guest Ellie Joy, who is the sister of Holly. It, she's another and, one. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, another one, a different one. <laughs> But even Jordan Peterson could not save Rebecca from the wasps. Okay, there are so many wasps out here. I'm going to go inside. There were moments when it was touch and go. Hang on a second, sorry. There were questions, hasty decisions made. Taken to. Uh, is that wind? Wind something. But at last, she reached safety. I can't believe you tried to record outside. <laughs>